Resident Evil 6 is a title that the term polarizing may as well have been invented for. While it does have its supporters, a slew of angry game reviewers with a hell of a lot of reach made dumping on this game more popular than any trend in recent memory. And hey, there's a good chance most of you watching hate the game too, probably because it took a formula you loved and altered it so much you could barely recognize it. And if that is the case, well, my guess, welcome to the club we OGRE fans have been in for years. But today, we're here to figure out what exactly is underneath all that hype, and let's be honest, most importantly, take a look at every single way you could conceivably play this game. After all, RE6 strove to achieve a pretty impressive look, and some at the time of its release, myself very much included, would have argued it was a little too good looking for the hardware it was released on. So the goal is to cover every RE6 port I can get my hands on and compare them side by side. The good, the bad, and the interesting quirks that come with slapping a game on several platforms at once. Oh, and if you haven't noticed by now, I'm actually relatively sick, so if my voice sounds really weird, it's because it has to work its way through several razor blades that are stuck in my throat at the moment. But let's make the best out of a bad situation and perform a bit of an experiment. How many of you guys have been listening to me and unconsciously have cleared your throat for me while listening to this intro? I do that all the time when I listen to YouTube, and I wanted to see if anyone else does as well. Anyways, I hope you guys have brought an open mind and an interest in technical nonsense, because you're going to need a lot of both. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews, and I have not said this in a very long time. Welcome to the Resident Evil Retrospective. By this point, I hope I've made a bit of a name for myself, but if you're watching this right now with no context, let me lay a few things out. I am a massive fanboy for the original survival horror titles in the Resident Evil series. You guys know the deal. Pre-rendered backgrounds, tank controls, limited inventories, backtracking, all the stuff you would associate with those older and, in my mind, better RE titles. Which means a lot of the newer entries in the series, while being mostly competent, well-made video games I've had hours of fun with are, in my opinion, a little undeserving of the words Resident Evil printed on their covers. Now I am fully willing to admit this is a personal thing and I'm not about to make an objective argument on the matter. Well, not in this video anyways. However, the reason I'm starting with this little confession is because I sort of, kind of enjoy RE6. And there's probably a lot of reason for that. Above it having solid gameplay in my opinion, I really bought into the whole RE6 is the worst game ever hype and didn't play it for the first time until a few years ago. So there's a good chance a lot of what I'm feeling here is just surprised the damn thing didn't exit my computer, gain sentience, and try to kill me. Because if we're going off of popular opinion at the time, that was a chance I was very much taking. Now before you start setting your keyboard on fire with angry ass comments, trust me, I am very familiar with this game's faults and I can assure you they annoy me just as much as they do you. The only difference is I also think there's some fun to be found in the game. So how about this, we'll quickly go over just what RE6 is and how it operates so that everyone's starting on the same level, and then after we try to build a case for it being pretty okay, we will burn it to the ground with criticism. And if you're here just to see the ports get compared and go head to head, go ahead and skip to the timestamp on screen or use the chapters to get past the boring stuff. Alright, for everybody else, let's go ahead and jump in. What the hell? You wanna tell me what the hell just happened? Resident Evil 6 is on one hand a continuation of RE4's drastic changes to the series formula and on the other about as far from them as humanly possible. Making a return, we've got the over-the-shoulder perspective, limited inventory, quick-time-laden gameplay, and heavy action focus seen in both RE's 4 and 5. And similar to those titles, you can expect a pretty lengthy playtime, at least in RE terms. The core story is going to take you a good 20 or more hours to get through, but instead of having players see that story from just one perspective, the game's broken up into three parts, starring six main protagonists, and this was one feature I actually kind of liked. 
All of the major campaigns have their own unique, more self-contained stories, but they also intersect with each other to form a core narrative of what's going on, and I won't go too far into that since I already covered RE6 a while back. So if you're looking for a much closer look at all the stuff I'll probably gloss over here, I'd suggest checking out the little card on screen right now or the link in the description to check that video out. But without going into a lot of detail, I think even the most hardcore RE6 detractor would agree this might be the most involved story the series has seen so far. There's a lot going on here, and the main cast of returning RE alumni are tied to several government organizations that are working towards similar goals but in different and sometimes competing ways. Like you'd expect, sometimes that puts them in opposition to each other, giving us the schoolyard matchup of the century in a Chris vs. Leon fist fight, something I think all of us have wondered about at some point. We also get to see Sherry Birkin make her triumphant return to the series, which I'll admit was not a big deal for me at first, but after finishing her section of the story, I really enjoyed her character. There's also the introduction of a brand new character in the form of Jake, Although without spoiling anything, I'll just say this is a little more of a returning cameo than a full-on new addition to the cast. Trust me, you'll get it when you play it. Wait, what? The order you complete these campaigns in doesn't really matter as each one mostly overlaps the others in terms of major events, but I will say finishing all three is a must to get the full story, and in my opinion, that's going to be a really easy ask. Depending on which scenario you go with, there's going to be a lot of returning motifs. Rogue organizations releasing deadly viruses, turning whole cities into zombies, government cover-ups, and self-sacrificing love interests. And don't you dare give me shit for that. Everybody knows, at least in RE6, Piers plays a better Ada than Ada does. It's where you belong. Of course, I'm not about to say this is my favorite tale ever told in a Resident Evil game before, but I think there's a lot here in terms of returning series orthodoxy and brand new additions. You'll definitely find what I would call acceptable levels of camp and flat-out dumbness. Back for more. Which is pretty on brand for the franchise, I think we can all agree, but overall I'd say the story is one of the better and least controversial aspects on offer here. And since such a slim minority of the complaints circulating the internet are centered around this game's story, I figured we should instead jump into a semi-brief summary of how the game actually plays, followed by a well-deserved roasting. RE6 piggybacks off of the over-the-shoulder perspective and gameplay introduced in RE4 with a whole lot of tinkering going on under the hood. The first big change is the fact that, to my knowledge, this is the first numbered RE game that allows for simultaneous movement and shooting right out of the box, which expectedly feels really damn good. Of course, to make up for this newly acquired mobility, enemies now have the opportunity to get at you from more than 20 horizontal feet away, but overall I'd say combat feels really natural here. So much so that games with this original iteration of combat, like Ares 4 and 5, feel much more clunky and limiting when switching directly from 6, which is exactly what you'd expect from a sequel. That being said, unlike its over-the-shoulder forefather, 6 doesn't opt in to the tank control concept of up on the D-pad always being forward for your character, with left or right rotating them in that direction. Instead, it's a more traditional third-person scheme here, and I do see why they did this. They obviously needed to make room for the mobility options we'll get into later, but I feel like this is a much less precise method. Much like RE5, 6 has a real-time inventory, so you'll need to make sure you're clear of any threats before you go around trying to mix herbs, and it's worth mentioning the menu is limited in space, something we will once again talk about just a bit later. The quick-time events that helped put RE4 on the map have made a return, but in a much more significant way this time around. Nearly every second of gameplay and cutscenes you'll come across in this game requires some form of these things to pass and it is just about as annoying as you might think. There's a skill system that, with only a few minute exceptions, makes nearly no impact on how the game plays, but I did actually enjoy grinding missions to get EXP, so I guess take that for what it's worth. Like I mentioned earlier, RE6 has a lot of options as far as mobility is concerned, and if you ask me, this is one of its standout features, but not in the way you might be thinking. I know that sounds cryptic and stupid, so let's break it down. No matter which character you're using, you'll have access to a whole lot of stuff that makes the game really fun to play, like a lunging dodge in any direction, on top of all kinds of modifiers. 
for example, you could dodge roll out of the way, but instead of wasting the time it takes to get up and keep shooting, you can continue holding the aim button and your character will aim and shoot from the ground. And while that sounds really cool, you have even more options from there. For example, you could crawl forwards or backwards or roll to the left or right. It's a really cool system. And don't even get me started on how much fun it is to bust out into an action movie-like slide while you're running. It's unexpectedly deep when you get down into the weeds and start messing around with it. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that this game lives and dies on its mobility system. But the interesting part of all of this is the fact that you will not need to use any of this to beat the game. I'd estimate a casual player could see the end credits on all the campaigns just taking advantage of being able to run and walk in any direction. The more nuanced movement options really only needs to come in play if you want a more satisfying experience. When you think about it, it's a lot like a Devil May Cry game. Sure, there are all these deep options available to more advanced players, but it's not something a casual player will even need to be aware of. If you ask me, that's a pretty cool way to develop a video game. Like, here's a bunch of cool shit to do. Feel free to utilize it, but don't worry, you don't have to. In my opinion, it's fairly likely that at least some of the people not happy with their time in RE6 may have been missing out on one of the most fun aspects of its playstyle, and it's not exactly their fault. The game goes so far into the realm of not pushing these things on you that there's no tutorial teaching you how most of it works. If you aren't paying attention to the hints on the loading screens, you may have never known any of this stuff exists. Sure, it may not be a total game changer, but it could have provided that little extra bit that turned the experience around for at least some of you out there. These assholes have anything better to do? And since that section may have already given away the point here, I'll go ahead and come out with it. I genuinely think Resident Evil 6 is a fun video game. It provides an action-packed, ridiculously dumb experience that, while flawed in a lot of ways, manages to be really engaging and fun, at least most of the time. Now, right when I say that, your first instinct is going to be to immediately compare 6 to any other numbered Resident Evil title and use that as proof that it sucks, and there's good news there. We agree. While this is a more than playable, even really enjoyable video game on its own, as an RE game it sucks about 467 metric tons of ass. But here's the kicker. None of you seem to be using that same standard when other radically different RE games are concerned. When I make statements like RE4 is an awesomely fun game but a poor Resident Evil title, I get inundated with comments about how dumb I am. And I've got to assume there's at least a good amount of crossover between the people who enjoy RE4 and hate RE6. I really want to make this clear, there's nothing wrong with liking one over the other, but if your reason for liking one is the same reason you hate the other, well, maybe that's a good sign that you're operating more on nostalgia than, let's say, rational thought. Now to be totally fair, I am most certainly guilty of that as well, but I try to make it really clear when that's the driving factor in these videos, and in this one instance, I'm trying to be about as objective as a person can be when giving an opinion. If we're using Resident Evil's 1 through Code Veronica and maybe Remake and Zero as our standard, then 4, 5, and 6 are just not going to measure up. They are totally different games, and while one side of that dichotomy may be more enjoyable to you, I don't think you could argue that they are in any way similar from a mechanical or purely content-driven point of view. One half of that group is a slow-paced, exploration-driven subset of the adventure game genre, and the other is a fast-paced, third-person shooter with an emphasis on spectacle and set pieces. So no, RE6 is not a good Resident Evil game, and in that sense, you haven't really had one in a very long time. It is, however, a perfectly fun and more importantly functional game that offers what I would call a good value from a gameplay's perspective. <laughs> perspective. Let's try that again. My mistake. It is, however, a perfectly fun and more importantly functional game that offers what I would call a good value from a gameplay perspective. The heavy action focus may approach or even surpass a Fast and Furious movie in terms of sheer stupidity, but good stupid fun is not the worst thing to have bursting from every seam in your video game. Is it hard to take the game seriously when you see something like this on your screen? Without a doubt, but to be fair, if you're taking Resident Evil games seriously in a world where this is one of the absolute most well-reviewed games in the series, maybe the problem's more with you than the game. And look, I'm not here to simp for RE6. It most definitely has some real issues, but my point here is that it's a pretty solid video game, all things considered. 
I am, however, not in the business of leaving things unsaid, so I figure we should discuss some of the worst offenders on that list. In the spirit of fairness, though, I'd also like to offer a counter to each of my complaints. You know, something that might even the scales, as it were. Hey, I've got to do something to earn this massive paycheck I get from Capcom every month for defending this game. I want 200,000 up front, another 200 when this is over. I want BOWs, those are extra. First up, since I am a guy driven by visuals, we have to talk about the rampant use of low resolution textures across the entire game. Now they do blend very well from far away, but when you get up close, about 20% of the textures you'll see in the environment will be noticeably lower res than everything around it. Something that Capcom can't blame on their engine. RE6 uses MT Framework 2.0, which doesn't have any built-in limitations I'm aware of that would require some assets to be so small, so I can't really explain why they would have such low-quality 2D textures, but on the plus side, the game makes heavy use of some very impressive-looking lighting. There are some real-time shadow-casting light sources scattered around, but mostly it's all pre-baked stuff. That being said, the game does a great job lighting things in a very moody and attractive way, regardless of whether or not you can interact with those lights dynamically. Combine that awesome looking lighting with the majority of the textures that are perfectly good looking at higher resolutions, and you get a picture that can sometimes look maybe a little amateur, but almost always looks really impressive. Now personally, I've always kind of preferred lighting to be the graphical trick you use to make your game look a little more realistic or interesting maybe, so this might just be me, but I think this whole complaint is a wash when you combine it with all the good stuff surrounding it. Next up are the insufferably numerous quick time events. These things seem to be placed every other minute of both real time gameplay and cutscenes and at no point do they stop getting on my nerves. This issue was one of the larger pieces of criticism hurled at Capcom when the game first dropped, and it's one that I think's fair and unfair at the same time. Because on one end, obviously they overdid it. I mean, that just flat out can't be argued. But on the other, didn't we sort of ask for this? I mean, really. When RE4 first released, the QTEs were the talk of the town, and nearly a million pretentious journalism majors penned think pieces on how they were the next phase of video game interactivity. Hell, you guys watching just do a bit of soul searching. Did you ever vocally profess your love for them in RE4 before? I'd be willing to bet that if we're being honest, a good percentage of you guys did. And that being the case, is it totally on Capcom for correctly interpreting the market based on fan feedback? I mean, yes, they definitely botched the execution, but without a doubt, we are the root cause for their inclusion in the first place. And by the way, let it not be said I'm just a fanboy for Capcom. Trust me, a good 20% of my day and 85% of my streams are dedicated to talking shit about nearly every business and marketing decision they've ever made. Really and truly, despite the fact that they did some incredible things in the 80s and 90s, I kind of think Capcom sucks, but maybe in this one instance they were just tripping over themselves to include mechanics that in the past got them tons of fan praise. So to sum this whole thing up, yes the amount of QTEs in this game is way out of control and maybe we deserve at least a bit of the blame for that. So how could we possibly turn this into a positive? Well, eventually, RE6 would get an update that did a lot of stuff, like making Ada's campaign unlocked by default, but along with it came an option that was sort of there the whole time, but locked behind the easiest difficulty. The auto action button setting in the options menu allows you to not have to input anything during cutscene QTEs that would normally result in a game over if failed. The prompt still shows up, and your instincts may have you fumbling to grab your controller when you see it, but even with no input at all, these things will still count as completed, allowing you to actually enjoy the cutscenes and all of their ridiculous glory. The QTEs that take place during actual gameplay still require you to pass them and are still very annoying, but you really can't look a gift horse in the mouth on this one. And you just know Capcom really got this message loud and clear because this option is enabled by default now. Of course, it would have been nice to not have to Google that since there's no real indicator that tells you you don't have to perform the quick time events anymore, but I guess beggars can't be choosers, right? One pervasive criticism hurled at RE6 from the very get-go is how over-the-top it is with its action sequences, and in no uncertain terms do I disagree with that. This game is the absolute definition of jumping the shark, on top of the fact you jump an actual shark. 
Nearly every section of the game ends in some kind of life or death struggle, an explosion, or in some occasions, the fan favorite jumping a motorcycle over a helicopter. And the element that helps even this out ends up being the issue itself. Yes, it absolutely goes overboard with the action elements, but in its defense, they get the job done. Even if you hate the game, it's almost impossible to play it for 20 minutes or more and not at least see your heart rate increase. So I guess if the goal was to get players excited, I'd say mission accomplished, boys. However, there might be some of you out there who don't prefer this, which is understandable, but again, I'm gonna have to turn that back around on you. Once again, this is the only logical response any company could have had to the hysteria centered around the absolute best video game ever crafted by human hands, RE4. I'm sure we all remember that game's launch, and on the tip of every fan and reviewer's tongue was the pulse-pounding action to be found within. Then we got RE5, which was an evolution of all those same ideas, followed by 6, which would again add more of the same. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, how many times have you started up a sequel to a beloved franchise and hoped it didn't add anything to the elements you liked in its predecessor? Of course they were going to include more action. We all essentially told them that's exactly what we wanted to see. So I guess the conclusion there is, well, I hope you never praised RE4 or 5 for any of these elements in the past, because if so, not to be mean, but you've got a few more servings of humble pie to eat before you can honestly criticize this game. And again, I'm not saying you can't enjoy these elements. I mean, we agree that they're at the very least in too high a quantity to be enjoyable, but when it comes time to blame who's responsible for all this, I think you might need a mirror in your house. Well, I'm done vilifying you now, so lastly we have one of my biggest criticisms and for the life of me, I cannot find a balance for this one. So we'll have to break the format I just laid out, but I don't really care because it needs to be said. Above anything else that everyone always complains about, this is the one thing I don't really see mentioned as much, but RE6 assigns way too many damn functions to way too many buttons. During a typical, I don't know, 30 minutes of gameplay in RE6, you might need to complete maybe 4 or 5 core actions. There's opening doors or passageways, browsing your inventory, using an item, attacking an enemy, and lastly there's any other kind of interaction you might need to do with the environment like climbing a ladder or jumping up on a ledge. The problem being, you're going to have to press different buttons to perform those actions depending on the context those actions are taking place in. For example, if I need to open a door, I have to use the interact button, right? But some doors require a partner to be present, so I'm going to have to use the partner button there. And listen, I get this has to do with how the game loads resources in and out of memory. You're going to have to have your partner with you if they're going to purge the previous area from cash. But it's not like I have any other options at these doors. Why not just make the normal interact button usable here instead of a totally different one? And the same thing goes for items. Up and down on the d-pad will switch between healing items that I can see on screen and use, but I need to go into a totally different menu and hit a different button to combine herbs and then turn them into these weird health pill things. Now, setting aside how dumb it is that I have to do this anyways, why not just make the green herbs mixable with the up and down directions? Or, at the very least, why not make them usable from that menu without having to mix them? I feel like that's pretty insane to ask of me. I mean, the menu is total dog shit as far as design goes, and it's all in real time, so I can't exactly pause the action to mix herbs up on the fly. So, why is this included? Jesus, I feel like I could have spent an entire 15 minutes of this video talking about that one issue. But anyways, there's a similar problem with picking up items. A totally separate button from the interact key has to be used to pick up things off the ground. And if you haven't noticed the theme here yet, it's that all of these functions have multiple buttons that can execute them at different times depending on the context, which is very frustrating. I think the intro section with Leon probably does the best job of making my point for me. Right here I have to grab a green herb and give it to my partner, so I press one button to break the glass. I press that button again to open the door, a separate button to grab the herb, then a totally separate button to open my menu and mix the herb, and then a fourth separate button to use that herb on my partner. The worst part being, none of this is even remotely necessary. I mean, if I need to pick up an item, I don't need to use the interact button for anything else, so why not have it pick up items when I'm on top of an item and climb a ladder when I'm in front of a ladder? 
And the same exact thing goes for doors. If I'm unable to do anything at a partner door other than open that door, why make a totally different button necessary? It's not like I can interact with the door in any other way. I feel like this is some game design 101 type of shit. I tell you what, let's do this. Let's take a game that we all agree is pretty damn good, like Resident Evil 4. In that game, you can open doors, climb ledges, melee attack enemies, and pick up items with the same exact button. Now, did any of you find that to be frustrating or hard in any way, shape, or form? Did anyone have problems doing any of those actions at any time? Given the amount of fan love for that game, I'm gonna have to assume the answer is a hard no. Interestingly, out of everything RE6 gets wrong, which is a lot, this is by far the worst defender and for some reason I see almost no one talking about it. Instead, I see constant complaints about it being too easy to run out of ammo, something I have literally never done in this game before. Like, literally. By the way, as a bit of an FYI, if you do have that problem, hitting aim and fire at the same time staggers enemies, allowing you to melee them and then kill them on the ground, which 100% solves that problem. To be totally fair though, I had no idea this mechanic existed when I started my first playthrough and got to the end of the game with enough ammo for each weapon minus the grenade launchers to continue playing a full nother playthrough. And let's just say I'm not the best at these type of games. Well, problems and upsides considered, I think the conclusion here is that RE6 is a very dumb game that's also very fun to play. It's not a gaming revolution or some kind of landmark release that propelled the industry forward, but instead, a pretty good game. It suffers from a lot of issues for sure, and I tried to list some of the bigger ones here, but at the end of the day, I'd say the ups overshadow the downs. Now you might disagree and that's totally fine, but at least from my perspective, this is a game that fell victim to that angry reviewer culture prevalent at the time of its release. Which I'm not saying to diminish any of RE6's actual problems, but regardless of how much it deserved its criticism, the fact of the matter is, for a lot of games media at the time, there was big money in shitting on RE6. And when you're in a situation like that, it can be really hard to tell who's being sincere with their problems and who's hamming it up a bit for clicks. I lost all my men because of her! And I lost over 70,000 people! I think if anything, my point basically gets proven by the flood of we might have been wrong about RE6 style articles and YouTube videos that have come out since the whole angry review fad died out. Shout out to Boulder Punch, by the way, that guy rules. Anyways, the point being, I think people may have judged this game a bit too harshly, but in their defense, there were some elements in the game that were worthy of being judged at least a little harshly. So if you're like me and you didn't play RE6 for years based solely on those reviews, maybe now's the time to. But if you are going to do that, the question becomes how exactly you go about it, and luckily I have all the major ports on hand. So what do you say we get down to the business of comparing those bad boys? Shit! Don't let him in! And I think in any port showdown, it's probably a good idea to start from the beginning. Meaning we're gonna have to talk about the first generation of high definition consoles, which I think we can all agree was more of a stumbling point than any kind of real move forward for the industry. You had to worry about hardware failures no matter which console you bought, performance was always garbage, and it seemed like the tech used to make video games at the time matured much faster than the consoles made to play them leading to a lot of resource saving tricks that affect the video output enough to call into question the whole HD label being thrown around on these things. So it stands to reason RE6 is not going to run very well on these guys, but I think it's still worth checking out both the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions, if anything just for the sheer curiosity of it. But also because it's important to see where you came from so you can really appreciate where you are. And in that spirit, I say we start with the PS3 version of RE6, a fairly standard release for the time and the platform. Too many good agents have died here today. You're not getting added to that list. This port of the game goes for a native 720p picture and targets 30 frames per second, and if you've seen my last few videos, it's not going to surprise you that the PS3 does not do a great job at maintaining that 30fps ceiling. The 720p output, however, is actually great looking in a very specific scenario. If you watch my video covering Fear and its ports, you'll know I sort of have a thing for seeing 720p displayed in its native form, meaning your display won't be scaling the image to fit a larger resolution. I use a 1440p monitor, which gives a nice 2 times integer scale to 720p, but it also offers a pixel-by-pixel -pixel mode, which applies zero scaling, and despite the fact that I have to play games looking at this, 
it's actually really sharp. Now taking the 360 and PS3 ports and checking on the smaller details, there's clearly a lot of clarity lost here, but if you do play this on a native 720p panel, you may not notice much of this anyways. Now obviously this is a very outlier type of situation that most people are not going to run into with their setups, but if I had to guess, I'd say that's exactly why at least some of you come here in the first place. But on the less esoteric side of things, we have a few anomalies going on in terms of frame rate. Overall, the PS3 version drops frames all over the place, which is to be expected, and trust me, this is nothing compared to the demo that was released before launch, but other than that, I noticed the PS3 and 360 versions would often trade places in terms of which one performed better. In some scenarios, you'll see the 360 take the lead in average frame rate, and in others, the PS3 edges a victory out. I found this to be pretty interesting, and I'm assuming it has something to do with how efficiently each aspect of the game was ported over, or maybe one console having an advantage when it comes to displaying certain effects. Regardless of the reason though, it seems like this almost always results in maybe a 2 or 3 frame difference, so on paper it's not much, but we'll confirm that in the next section. When things on screen get hectic, which is almost always in this game, you're definitely going to feel that drop in performance and this is going to make timing sensitive tasks like countering an attack noticeably more challenging, but to be honest, when you're checking out games from this generation, this should be expected. I mean, come on, it was our first real shot at HD gaming in the living room, and even at the best of times, this industry can drop the ball pretty damn hard. All in all though, you're still getting the same exact experience here that you would on any other console, minus the obviously lower output resolution and fluctuating frame rate, but if I'm being honest, this might have been the easiest playing 7th gen offering of RE6. But having said that, we're definitely going to have to give Microsoft their fair shot. <sighs> The Xbox 360 release of Resident Evil 6 uses internal upscaling, so while you may have 1080p output, it's being derived from a native 720p image, but honestly it works really well. At first, with how much more detail was present on the 360 compared to the PS3, I sort of assumed it was native 1080p, but when comparing the actual 1080p output from a PS4 port, it seems clear that's not the case. But you might be asking yourself, how the hell did you come to that conclusion? Well, you see here how much more viewable real estate there is on the PS4 release versus the PS3 720p? Well, when we throw the 360 into the mix, we see it matches almost perfectly with the PS3 in every way. You can tell both ports look almost narrow in their vertical field of view compared to the PS4. Now that might not be too exciting to talk about, but I'm actually kind of stoked that I've stumbled upon a way to determine whether or not we are dealing with native 1080p or 720p upscales in these kind of consoles. I don't know, I'm a dork like that. That being said, the 360's internally upscaled picture looks so much more defined and clear compared to the PS3. It's night and day between the two, so if we're talking sheer looks, the 360's taking that W with no contest. Now I know I sound like a hypocrite because I just spent a good amount of time hyping up the PS3 720p, but let's be honest, most people will not be playing these games on a display that can accommodate that. So in terms of real world expectations, this is the better looking option by a country mile. On the plus side though, with both of the 7th gen console ports, I didn't notice any reduction in lighting effects or texture detail, which is really nice and also might explain the poor performance. And since we're talking about it, like I said earlier, the 360 can perform worse or better than the PS3 depending on the scenario, which is interesting I guess, but going on pure gameplay, I might prefer the PS3. Realistically, I'm probably not noticing the slight 1 or 2 frame per second differences between the two, but looking at both of their frame time charts, it seems like the 360, even when it's performing better, will have more spikes than the PS3. Meaning that while the PS3 may not outperform the 360 in terms of raw FPS, it's delivering those frames at a much more consistent rate. And I know that sounds like a bunch of nonsense to some of you, but think of it this way. Something that is consistently slow can be adapted to on your end. I mean, it's not ideal, but mentally your brain can adjust to having to do things at a different time than it's used to. When frames are being delivered at a less consistent rate though, you can't really get used to it because it's always changing. Here's hoping that clears that up a bit because I can't really think of another way to explain it. So this port of RE6, while looking much, much better, sort of performs worse when you factor in both frame rate and frame time, but if we're being honest here, the difference is in very small degrees. The only way I'd imagine your average player would even notice this is if they went from one to the other directly like I did. 
If you do happen to be in the market for a flawed RE6 experience though, and you're wondering which one to settle on, I'd say go for the 360. The difference between it and the other option is there, but I don't think a normal person would benefit from the small, if not imperceptible advantage the PS3 has. So I'd recommend going by the old Avalanche Review's mantra of when in doubt, go with the best looking option. And keeping with that spirit, let's move on to the next port on our list. This next set of ports hit PS4s and Xbox Ones about four years after the originals landed on their predecessors, and it seems clear to me this was the type of hardware Capcom was targeting when developing the game. These versions of RE6 output a native 1080p at a much more acceptable 60 frame per second ceiling, and right off the bat, the clarity and detail gained from an internal 1080p render compared to the 360's upscale is just staggering. Every scene here on the PS4 looks so much better by comparison, in, and I guess that's to be expected with a port being released so long after the original. Also, this version of the game uses what very well may be my favorite controller ever, so I might be biased, but things seem to flow pretty well for me most of the time. And so far, things are exactly like you would expect. You have a better console with better performance and a better looking picture, but even with the evolved hardware, you're still going to see stutters and hitches when things start to get hectic. Sometimes it's in a scene where you would expect it to happen, like when there's a lot on screen, but sometimes it'll happen when Chris is just body slamming a single guy in an empty room. Of course, on paper, the frame rate, especially compared to what we just looked at, is relatively smooth, but sadly that makes it a bit worse since you're going to really feel the random spots where frames start to drop. Of course, it's not going to have an overly negative effect on you actually playing the game, but I think it will still bother a few people. Having said that though, even with the dips, the jump from 30 to 60 FPS expectedly makes this the far better playing option we've covered so far. It's not all great news though. While I was playing the PS4 version, I noticed something I really couldn't remember coming across in the previous versions, and that's this very noticeable color banding taking place here. It's really easy to point out in these darker scenes, but it seems to be present all the time. For those of you who don't know what that term means, it just refers to the bands formed by shades of colors or levels of transparency overlapping. Normally, you'd want them to transition smoothly into each other using a gradient, but here we get these very defined steps in between each shade. So I did my due diligence and went back and checked the 360 version, and sure enough, the color banding was indeed there, but I think a difference in sharpness and brightness makes it much more noticeable on PS4. Kind of interesting how increasing visual fidelity helps also increase any flaws with it. And I would absolutely love to stay in the land of a mostly solid 60 frames per second and 1080p video output, but we've got another port to cover, and this one is actually really interesting. She you to the Switch port of Resident Evil 6 is the most recent version we'll look at today with a release date of 2019. It outputs a very good looking internal 1080p picture and targets 30 frames per second. Right off the bat, I noticed it had a much sharper and clearer image than the 360 and PS3 versions, but that was a little weird for me since I had assumed they would opt for an internally upscaled 720p to save on performance. But sure enough, putting the 360 version next to it revealed the extra pixels that can only come from a higher resolution. Obviously, this is going to lead to a much better looking picture than its other 30 FPS competitors, but when looking at it under the microscope, the frame rate seemed marginally worse. Which I guess makes sense, I mean it's running at an internal 1080p, it's going to tax the hardware pretty bad, and we're talking about the Switch here, there's not exactly a lot of overhead as far as performance is concerned. But there's a bit of an anomaly going on here, because even though the frame rate was maybe 1 or 2 FPS lower in any given scenario when comparing the older original versions, it felt much smoother to me while playing. In fact, during a recent live stream where me and a buddy played this version, we both assumed it was a rock solid 30 FPS based on how good it felt, but I might have an explanation for that and it's one you've already heard before. And you guessed right, this is indeed another scenario where the frame rate on one end may be a little worse, but frame time is a lot more consistent so it ends up feeling a little smoother. That anomaly aside though, I can tell you this thing looks stunning on the Switch's built-in screen. The internal video may be rendered at 1080p, but in portable mode, the Switch's screen can only achieve 720, so the image essentially gets super sampled and the result is much more sharpness and detail than I'm used to seeing on this console. 
Well, it's either that or the game actually renders it out at 720p, and we get that effect I was talking about earlier where native 720p looks great on a 720p screen. I'm not really sure, and I don't have the tools to analyze that, but either one, it looks great. In fact, it looks so good on that screen that the inherent value of being able to play this game away from your TV increases exponentially. And really, that's something you have to factor in. Now, personally, I'm not too big on mobile gaming because I spend all day sitting at home playing ports of games no one really cares about. So obviously, I never really have to travel too far, and when I do, it's not on any public transit. So maybe I don't have much use for the on-the-go nature of the Switch, but I can't deny this would make for a much more fun trip if I found myself needing to take one. Altogether, I would say this version might be the most impressive so far, but that mostly comes from how little needed to be sacrificed to get it running smoothly on Nintendo's purposely underpowered hardware. If you're looking into playing RE6 away from home, this'll be your only portable option, so it'll be a pretty easy choice to make, but if you do go with this port, you aren't missing out on much of anything, at least where the 30 FPS releases are concerned. But that being said, I am very tired of seeing half the acceptable frame rate taking place on my screen, so what do you say we jump back into the real performers? Oh my god! Moving on to the real current generation of RE6 offerings, we have a console that gives the Zebo a run for its money in the stupid name category, the Xbox Series X. Sadly, RE6 is not on Microsoft's list of backwards compatible 360 games, but there is a good reason for that. Resident Evil 6 is already playable on Series X via the Xbox One release, which is the same version you'll get if you buy the game off the Microsoft Store on the Series X. Now, it is sort of important to mention that I wasn't able to drive my Series X, god, I am tired of saying that name already, to 1440p for some reason. When I try anything over 1080p 60, I get this fun screen, and I think it might have to do with a really shitty long run of HDMI between the consoles and my capture solution. So as much as it pains me to say this, it's gonna have to be just 1080p 60 frames per second for us until I do some serious setup renovations. And having said that, this port of the game is actually not too impressive. I mean, it basically has the same sharp, detailed picture you'll find on the PS5 or PS4 versions, but despite this console dwarfing what would be necessary for a smooth frame rate in such an old game, we still see dips all over the place, but that's not even the start of the strange stuff. See, I got a little curious and put the PS5, PS4, and Series X ports up against each other to see if the same slowdown could be pinpointed at the same scene. At least that way we could confirm whether or not this was an Xbox problem or a Capcom problem. And I was rather blown away to see that there was slowdown across all models, but in different parts of the same scene. So while the PS5 would struggle on a section of a cutscene, the Series X would skate by with a lock 60, only to drop frames on a portion the PS5 handled without an issue. I really can't say for sure what's going on here, but since some of the parts the Series X struggles at takes place just before some new assets are drawn on screen, I'm thinking this isn't so much a performance thing and maybe more of a read-write bottleneck and RAM kind of thing. I definitely could be wrong, but look here. See, just as the car is about to appear on screen, the Series X really starts struggling when even the PS4 holds a locked 60. And then after the car shows up, we see the frame rate start to climb back up on the Series X. Not even the explosion on screen causes it to dip again. I think a stutter like that isn't happening because the GPU can't keep up with a 10-year-old game, but maybe the assets in this specific port weren't arranged in a Microsoft-friendly way, causing an inefficient resource drain. I don't know. As you can see, I'm grasping at straws here, so if you know what might be going on, feel free to enlighten me in the comment section because I would genuinely love to know. That aside though, this port runs exactly like you would expect. I know I've been going on and on about frame rate dips and all that, but these are very, very small scenarios that take place maybe 0.1% of the time. Really, the only reason I mention this stuff is because I find it so interesting. These definitely are not downsides. For 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be the same great RE6 gameplay you're used to. There's no added benefits, or at least none I could take advantage of, so until I can test higher resolutions and how they perform, I'll have to end it here. I guess the best thing I can say about this port, or at least my ability to play it right now, is it basically just exists and does the job you think it would.
The PS5 port of RE6 has a relatively similar story to the Series X. It's just a backwards compatible PS4 title, and as such, you can expect roughly the same performance in this one, if not just a little better than what we just covered. I still notice dips in frame rate, which is disappointing, but again, these were not getting in the way of my enjoyment. The experience remains mostly smooth, and the 1080p output is exactly as sharp and nice looking as it was on PS4 or Series X or Xbox One. Now obviously, the same problem I talked about before still applies, so I can't test any higher resolutions, but at least as far as I'm concerned, 1080p looks great. One thing I found really funny and didn't really notice until I got all of my captured footage together is that each version of RE6 has its own default brightness level, and sure enough, there were some that were brighter or darker than other ports. Now this is definitely something you would expect to see on an older console with analog video output because that kind of a signal is so sensitive to capacitors or what kind of power is coming in or even the shielding on the video cable you're using. But with modern digital video, you would sort of expect a one-size-fits-all type of scenario. Now obviously, this is a setting you have full control over and these slight differences impact the game in no real noticeable way, but it was kind of an interesting little tidbit. Aside from that though, I really don't have much to say about this port because, well, it's basically just the PS4 version we just looked at, so I guess let's move on. All I can see is a shitstorm, and I don't think that's the half of it. And lastly, we need to talk about the PC port, which expectedly leads the pack in scalability and performance. I can't really say how it's going to run on lower-end hardware, and my setup is pretty damn overkill for a game of RE6, but I ran into no frame dips or stutters, aside from the ones caused by a very weird little quirk. It seems like no matter what kind of machine you're rocking, putting the FXAA setting above its default position, which I think is two times, will cause slight infrequent stutters. Now these were just barely noticeable to me because they were so slight and short-lived, but a viewer let me know what was causing the problem during a live stream. I can't really remember their name, but if that was you, thanks a lot. Obviously, this port of the game will have the most customization as far as display options go, but that's not going to be a surprise to anyone. The only real interesting aspect about this version that I can talk about that elevates it above the others, aside from its better performance, smoother frame rate, and higher resolution, is the fact that it can be played with a keyboard and mouse. For whatever reason, I've always preferred this kind of control scheme for third-person shooters, or really shooters in general, but this time around I found myself not being able to utilize my mobility options quite so well. The whole too many buttons, performing too many actions thing really comes into play here, and about two hours into capturing footage on PC, I broke down and had to use a controller. I have heard some people prefer a good keyboard for RE6, but I don't know if I have enough patience to commit all those functions to memory after learning them on controller. But hey, it's an option, and even though the keyboard didn't do it for me, aiming with a mouse is expectedly much easier and more precise. What would be really cool is if I could approach this with a sort of hybrid type of deal. Use a controller to move around and maybe a mouse to look and shoot, but this is one of those PC ports that feels the need to announce every time the input method changes. When this prompt is on screen, there's a second or two where you can't really do anything, so that basically makes that idea impossible, but having to use a controller is far from the worst deal in the universe. Especially when you consider the fact that this version has the potential to look better and run better than anything else on the list, given you have the hardware to pull that off. And this being a 10-year-old game, let's be honest, most of you probably do. It's over. Well, we are officially done, and huh, that was a lot of ports. I know the PS5 and Series X versions probably could have been left out, but come on, you know I'm not about to miss out on the chance to test a potentially interesting concept like backwards compatibility. If I had to classify each release, which, let's face it, I kind of do, I'd lump all of the 30 FPS releases together, and the same goes for the 60 and up crowd. That being the case, I would say the PS3 is probably the worst performer out of its group, even though it's only slightly. In the looks department, it definitely comes up last with its 720p output, but I will stress again, it can look good with the right gear. Between the two remaining options, the Switch maintains a much smoother feeling frame rate due to the better and more consistently delivered frame times, and it really is hard to discount seeing a full internal 1080p on the Switch. Plus, there's the obvious benefits of being able to take your Switch on the go. All of that considered, out of these lower-end options, I'd say the Switch is without a doubt the best move, and yeah, maybe that hurts a little to say, but sometimes that's how it goes. 
Moving on to the more big booty ports, the PC version takes the best looking position with ease. I'm running my copy of RE6 at 1440p and 100 frames per second, and that's obviously going to trample what's on offer in the consoles, but even at its higher resolution, you're gonna have to squint to really tell one from the other in my opinion. I think while RE6 is a great looking game, there might be a sort of ceiling to how good it can look, and maybe we've reached it. Even a guy like me who's absolutely obsessed with this stuff might have issues telling which version is which if you just sat me down in front of some unlabeled footage, leading me to make a very weird designation here. I don't think there's any one modern console release of RE6 that'll give you a noticeably worse or better experience as far as visuals and performance goes. Where one might lack, it almost always makes up for it in some other area, and I just couldn't come up with an objective list of winners or losers if you forced me to. So I guess the good news for you is, if you're looking to grab a copy of RE6 today and you're looking for the best port, you almost can't make a bad decision. So then the question becomes, instead of which one's better, which one's better for the consoles you own and your setup? Obviously, PC ports, with some notable exceptions, are always going to outperform their console brethren across versions of the same game, but that's almost the law of the universe. We all know it, and we all expect it. But seeing such parity between all of these different home releases, some years and years apart, is actually really cool. So feel free to pick at your best convenience, safe in the knowledge that you're going to get an awesome package regardless. And because I haven't abused my graphics card enough today, why not try and get every single port on screen at once, because why not add an hour to my render time? Enjoy, all two of you who ever wanted to see something like this. Well guys, thank you for sitting down and looking at a game you might not even enjoy for an hour or so. It feels really good to be covering Resident Evil games again, and if things go according to plan, I'll have a little more RE content headed down the pipe as well. But to make that a reality, I'm gonna have to get back to work, so until I see all of you again, thank you very much for watching the Resident Evil Retrospective. Well, welcome to the end of this long-ass endeavor. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to check in on an old man and his video game collection. If you liked what you saw here, I'll link some other port analysis videos I've made, and if you find yourself growing more and more in love with me, a quick look at my Patreon linked here on screen would be much appreciated. Of course, you can always show some support by becoming a channel member, liking the video, commenting, or simply sharing it around with some of your friends. And speaking of friends, I think it might be time for me to get my weekly 10 minutes of actual sunshine and then it's back to work. So I guess I'll talk to all of you guys later. Have a good one and maybe give RE6 a chance. You know, if you want. Now, peace out, nerds.